um, caused me a lot of social anxiety as well as I got older and sort of going to parties and things like that. I, I just had this sense that I was this worthless kind of boring person that nobody would want to talk to or, or would find at all interesting. So I, I just used to sit. I was a good listener. But I would never talk to people about myself or about my life because I just thought that they're just going to find me so boring. And, you know, it, it was really and it, it was really depressing, really hard because I, you know, I could I could see what I was doing, but I didn't feel like I had any way to to get over it because it, it was such a big thing in my head that, you know, I'm this boring, worthless person. I've had various degrees of kind of physical symptoms associated with anxiety sometimes I would just feel a bit shaky about going into a certain situation a strange kind of sensation quite often that would just come on me out of nowhere where I would just feel like I was not in the room anymore like I was kind of it felt like I was sitting behind a piece of glass and watching everything that was going on around me but I didn't understand why that was um, and it was absolutely terrifying because, you know, I kind of tried to talk to my friends and they didn't know what I was talking about because nobody else was experiencing this. And I just thought there was something extremely wrong with my brain. I, I was terrified. And the, the fear of that was just feeding into the general fear. And I was just in this kind of state of semi-panic most of the time. And the knock-on effect of that was that I um, I hated being in any rooms where I felt like I couldn't get out. I, if I was in any kind of small place like theatres or the back of a car or a bus, it would just make me feel really, really panicky and I would start to go into this derealized state. When I was in my late 20s, I did see a, um, a psychologist and we did a lot of CBT work around this kind of social anxiety and and that was really, really helpful. It, we kind of unpicked social situations. Like there was a time when um, I was working part time in school and and for some reason, social things got organised, like evenings out and that. And, and sometimes for nobody's fault, I would just get left out because I wasn't there all the time and people just kind of forgot about me a little bit because I wasn't a full time teacher. But in my head, it was like they deliberately left me out because they don't want me there. They're bo- and they think I'm boring. And so I, was, I suppose there was a degree of paranoia around things like that. But with the psychologist, I kind of took these situations and we broke them down and we kind of said, well, what, what was an alternative? What might, what might have been the cause of what, you th- what you're thinking? And, and I gradually kind of did get over some of those things and did sort of build up my ability to kind of socialise a little bit more. Somehow I managed to cope with it and I managed to carry on, but I think that came down to me having a massive amount of resilience, which I always go back to and feel that I'm very fortunate that that I had that somehow and it's pulled me through a lot of different situations. I first went to the doctors when I was 17, uh, struggling with depression. Again, I kind, of, I kind of probably knew at the time the reason I felt depressed was because I was sexually abused. I didn't tell the doctors. I couldn't tell them. I didn't feel ready to tell them. And it was only after the depression and the anxiety had come back maybe two or three times and it had gotten to a point where it was, it was looking quite, quite bad, let's say. And that, that was the, the sort of the catalyst for me. And again, I think that was a, certainly the catalyst for me to say, right, I need to, I need to sort this out now. And then again, I told the police, I told my family, and they, the police then put me in touch with a survivor's trust. And I had 10 or 12 weeks of counselling. And out of everything in my journey, that's the thing that probably happened the most. It, was, it wasn't so much, I, I can only remember maybe two or three counselling sessions out of the 12 or the 10 that we spoke about the abuse. It was more having someone there who was there to talk to you, completely talk to you for an hour every week. And you could talk to them about anything. You're talking about your relationships, your friendships, your work, your university course. And then occasionally we talk about the abuse. And then the, the relationship you formed with my, the relationship I formed with my therapist was probably the, at the time the strongest relationship I had with anyone. It was... It was incredible. I think perhaps that was the right time for me to have therapy. Maybe if I had it before, I wouldn't have appreciated it as much. And maybe if I'd left it any longer, it would have been too late. But 
I, I think in hindsight, I probably should have, I probably should have spoken to the doctors when I was 17. I think my life would have been, my, the end of my teenage years and my early twenties would have been very, very different if I'd had that conversation four years earlier. 